Hi, this is Dr. Langley Brady, and today we're going to talk about pain. Give me just a moment to share my screen. OK, so I created this presentation, just a short presentation, back in the spring because my pediatric practical students were having some issues not being able to understand how to use their pain scales. And I see this in Pete's Clinical all the time, so I'm hoping it will help you, not just in Pete's Clinical, but your adult clinicals, your practicums, and then your future career as nurses. So first, we're going to talk about relative. So he's pain relative. Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines relative as a word referring grammatically to an antecedent, right? So something that happens before something else or having a relation or connection to something or dependence upon another thing. Uh, so what do you think is pain relative? Well, I want to say yes, it is. For example, if I have an eight year old patient and I ask him what his worst pain ever was or what that 10 would be on that zero to 10 numerical rating scale, uh, he might say it was the day he fell off his bike and hit his knee in the concrete and it scraped all the skin off his knee. It's stinging, it's burning, it's bleeding everywhere and he's crying and it's a 10. But then if I ask an older adult that was in the military what their 10 was, that worst 10, perhaps it was a time they were serving in the Middle East and their truck hit an IED and exploded and the resultant injury left him in this immense amount of pain. So somebody's 10 is relative to their experience of pain. Does that make sense? So my 10 is not your 10. It won't be your neighbor's 10, your children's 10. Every one's pain experience is relative to their experience, lived experience with pain. So let's get started. Questions about some patients we had in the spring. Patient A, she's a four-year-old female. She was crying and guarding her abdomen. And her diagnosis was multiple inflammatory system response syndrome in childhood. It was related to COVID-19. And want to know, can we use the following pain scale for patient A's pain assessment? This is a Wong Baker faces pain rating scale. What do you think, four-year-old? So maybe, maybe it's the right answer because she has to be developmentally appropriate to use this scale. So think about this four-year-old child. She has to understand how her pain feels in her body and think about the face that she's making in response to this pain she's feeling and then be able to take that and project it out and match it up with a face on that pain rating scale to know that I'm a four and I'm that face that's a four. That takes a lot of developmental skill and not all four year olds can do that. So it's going to depend on your patient. Next, we have question two. Now this is patient Z. He was a 10 year old male. He came in with cervical adenopathy and throat pain. And using the numerical rating scale, he rated his pain a nine. However, at that time he was laughing and playing Uno with his parents. So how should that nurse proceed or the nursing student? Well, we know, we know, we know, we know. Distraction is huge in reducing pain. So there's a potential that that playing Uno with his parents could make him laugh and that's distracting his pain. A nine, that's kind of questionable, but it, it could work. So what do we do? Well, I set my students back in with a Wong Baker faces pain rating scale, right? And asked him to reassess his pain. So that faces scale. And you know what? He said his pain was a three. So we know in theory, right, depending on how our orders are written, that we know mild pain is zero to three on that zero to 10 scale. And so that's where your adjuvants come in. Your Tylenol, Naproxen, Ibuprofen, your ice, your heat, your massage, your repositioning, those farm and non-farm things help that sort of pain. And then we look at that moderate pain. Right, that's that four to six usually. That's when we're starting to use our really mild opioids or some of the combination opioid and adjuvant meds. So our Percocets, so things combined with Tylenol or combined with aspirin or ibuprofen. And then when we have that extreme pain, 
that significant pain, that seven to 10, um, is when we're getting our, our big guns, our big opioids out. So depending on what our order said, we say nine, nine, we're gonna go for those big meds using that numerical rating scale because that nine was based on his relative experience with pain. The worst thing he ever felt was a 10. So this was a nine to this child. Um, however, when he compared how his face was feeling to that Wong Baker face's pain rating scale, he rated it as a three. So never be afraid to go back in there and reassess using a different pain scale. Next, now this patient was 20 and yeah, with the rearrangement of patients with COVID, we had some older uh, patients on our floor. Um, she was a 20 year old female, came in with urosepsis. So she did have a history of spina bifida. So long history, a little, little less developmental skill than a lot of 20 year olds would have. But I walked in on my students taking her 12 o'clock vital signs and they used a numerical rating scale. And she replied, well, I'm not sure. Hmm. So I asked her if she had pain and she replied, well, I guess a little. Now we know our subject objective data, subjective, I could say patient stated, comma, quote, well, I guess a little, unquote. But how can we chart that when we have to give a number in our EHR? So I had my students reassess our pain level using which scale? What would you pick? The one we just talked about. So the faces scale. And let me tell you, she rated her pain a one. So she's right, her pain was a little, but she was developmentally unable to quantify what a little was, but she could think about how she was feeling and compare it to the face on the Wong Baker face's pain rating scale. Question four, now this was a patient in, he was an 18 year old patient, came in with cerebral palsy, aspiration pneumonia, pearl effusion, chest tube, all that sort of stuff. He was moaning and grimacing, but he couldn't form words. Which pain scale is appropriate for him? What do we think? Well, the flax scale, the face, legs, activity, crank, that's all ability scale, or the OPS, the objective pain scale. And we're gonna talk about pain scales in just a minute. So first I wanna to talk to you about the location I view. So AUMC and CHOG, we're gonna do all that charting in I view. University Hospital is different. So our charts are going to open to that pediatric quick view when we click on iView or the adult quick view, depending on what uh, patient population you're working with. And that's the top part that has the vital signs. And you see at the top in blue, we have pain score and pain scale. If you double click in the box where the, next to the pain scale, it's going to give you the drop down menu of all the approved pain scales that we can use in AUMC and CHOG. If you're not familiar with them, click on pain scale that's in the blue and it's going to pull up a list of all of these scales so that you can see them and read them and understand how to use them. And now we're going to talk about these scales really quickly. First one, numerical rating scale. You know this one. We typically ask it verbally, but it can be printed and handed to a patient as well if they need to see it and that visual works better for them. And of course, remember that, that zero no pain is fine, but that 10 is supposed to be the worst possible pain they can imagine not the worst they've ever had. And those can be quite different. Next is that flax scale again. Uh, and the way we could do this is that we go across each line. So look at the face and like zero says, no particular expression or smile. A one would be an occasional grimace or frown withdrawn or disinterested. And two would be frequent to cons constant frown, clenched jaw or quivering chin. We also look at what the legs are doing, their activity, if they're crying and consolability. A lot of students don't understand consolability. That's the ability for that parent or that nurse, that caregiver to pick up that child and console them or to hold them and console them, um, to comfort them. If you have a baby that's crying and you can swaddle, you change their diaper and give them a passy and swaddle them and pick them up and pat them and then they stop crying, then we don't need to worry about treating that pain. They're consolable, right? If you can't console them, you definitely have a problem uh, with your baby. Our next one, we have an OPS or objective pain scale. Now this is for infants, nonverbal children and adults, and any patient that can't communicate, including those that are ventilated or sedated. So uh, you go through, score them zero, one or two, and of course it pulls in blood pressure, some patho along with what they're doing, uh, physically doing. 
and add that up for a total pain score. Next we have um, OPS or objective pain scale for post-operative pain assessment. So if we're up on five, we get our post-op patients, we get a post-op kid back on four, you're in the ICU and you're getting somebody back or your adults, it doesn't matter. Um, but this has been tested and validated for patients eight months to 13 years. And it takes an average of the three previous systolic blood pressures and then other parameters such as crying movement and agitation for a total pain score. Next, we have NIPS for a neonatal infant pain scale. And it's recommended for children less than one year of age. Now do note though, I mean, I like, I prefer to use the flag. That's the one I have used most often, but whatever pain scale people are using, we need to use that same scale consistently because as you see, as we go through here, some of the scales have a different total score. It's not 10, it may be eight, maybe 17. So it's good to note and can be consistent with the pain scale that is used. And again, this one looks at the face, the crying, the breathing pattern, the arms, legs, and the state of arousal for a total score. Here's our NCS or Neo Comfort score. Now this one you're gonna see in a neonatal ICU, but sometimes uh, this may be a newborn nursery or we may get some neonates that get transferred to pediatrics and we need to know this. So we're looking uh, total pain score 17 or greater, you would notify the physician or the neonatal nurse practitioner. And then you're gonna score either that respiratory response, those are for ventilated patients, or crying for non-ventilated patients, but you don't score both of them. Get down, sorry. Next we have the Critical Care Pain Observation Tool, or CPOT. This again has got a compliance with ventilation because often pain will make them cough or fight that ventilator. Uh, or we're looking at vocalization from an extubated patient, uh, facial expression, body movement, muscle tension, and total score is eight here for the highest amount of pain. And then back to our FACES scale, our Wong Baker FACES pain rating scale, from zero no hurt or 10 to hurts the worst. Now it's good to note that this tool was originally created with children for children to actually help them communicate about their pain. And the scale is used around the world with people ages three and older and facilitating communication and improving assessments of pain management can be addressed. This isn't a pain tool, but an acronym, PQRST, and it's an acronym to help assess our client's pain. So P is provokes, what causes the pain, what makes it better, what makes it worse. Q is for quality. How does your patient describe their pain? R is for radiation. Does the pain move from one point of the body to another or multiple spots across the body? S is severity. Of course, that's that rating based on the scale that you use, the validated scale. And then T is for time. When does the pain start? How long does it last? When does it go away? And that's important to note that in some literature, using the acronym LMNO, PQRST, I don't know, lots, lots of letters now fit there. Um, but some uh, literature states that that is recommended. And this adds location of the pain, current medical treatments for the pain, the number of episodes of, of pain that this person may experience in a 24 hour period, and then onset, okay? So all of these things can make your patient's pain assessment even richer. Now we'll talk really quickly about farm and non-farm. How about farm plus non-farm? Because the combination of these two is highly recommended for your patients. So pharmacological, we have all of the plethora of medications that we can use. And of course, non-farm, you know what some of these are. Repositioning, heat, ice, massage, distraction, um, cool foods, aromatherapy, music therapy, pet therapy, uh, prayer, all sorts of things, healing touch, um, all sorts of things can fall in that non-farm. But in my experience, pain relief is even greater if we combine the two together. So 
I want to talk to you just really quickly, go back there, about a little boy we took care of recently. He had had a lumbar puncture and was having immense pain, rating it at a nine. He was a nine-year-old himself, and um, he had been given some PO Tylenol. And then my student and I, we made an ice pack and wrapped it in a really soft baby blanket and tucked back uh, near the area of this bandage and then I looked at mom and I said mom we need some distraction do you have an iPad a tablet a game anything he can play and and out she pulls it from her book bag and sets up the game and I looked at the boys and said, do you like popsicles he said yes I'd love an orange one so right here we've got pharmacological the Tylenol the non-farm being the ice the iPad being the distraction, something he was going to enjoy, um, orally stimulating him with the sweet orange cold a popsicle and all of those things together helped this little boy get his pain down to, I believe it a little bit later is about a three. So highly encourage you to think a little outside the box and add some non-farm with your farm or non-farm all by itself. Um, if your patient doesn't need any pharmacological approaches to manage their pain, if it's minimal enough. So, the end, there we go. And my little bouncy ball. So, better pain assessment can only lead to better pain management. So try to keep that in your mind and your approach to taking care of your, your little people, big people, and every other person during your career, including yourself. Take care, bye-bye. I hope this brief overview of pain has helped you. And do remember though that we can't have a score if we don't have a scale by which we measure it. We can't have a temperature unless we've measured it with a thermometer, axillary, orally, or rectally. So it has to be some mechanism by which we measure something and then a score, our measurement. And that is where our pain scale needs to be associated with the pain score and we get audited on a regular basis and quite often the nursing units are getting tagged because nobody's documenting this. So even if you see nobody else documenting that pain scale, be the nursing student, be that nurse that does it because not only it's required, <laughs> but we can't have a score unless we have a scale. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.